the key point to me, I think, is that knowledge is intensely, and I think perhaps increasingly political. A few examples chosen at random sort of makes the point, you know, the emergence of a knowledge economy have left some places and people uh, highly advantaged and others behind. Uh, the, the development of the knowledge economy has gone together with the sort of reurbanization of the economy, but not all cities have benefited from that. Some cities, um, you know, become superstar cities, the sort of centers of uh, the new sort of highly digitalized, connected uh, expert knowledge economy. Um, uh, and other places uh, have been left outside that sort of magic circle. And this is a phenomenon we see actually within cities, across nations, and globally. Um, as Richard Florida says, you know, the world hasn't become flatter, the world has become spikier, um, at least when it comes to the effect of um, uh, the effect of, of digitalization and the knowledge economy on cities. Um, uh, the way that we plan, design, regulate, fund our cities, shapes the sort of knowledge that is produced and who gets access to it. Um, so we have battles all the time about the design and, and planning of cities and, 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 and uh, who, who's in and who's out. Um, battles between truth and falsehood between uh, over, over you know, conspiracy theories and fake news rage across our, our, our media um, uh, and we have equally intense battles about how, if at all, these things should be uh, regulated. Um, and of course, we're seeing an almighty battle about um, a battle for public opinion and a sort of rival versions of the truth um, uh, in the horrible Ukrainian crisis uh, or you know, war at the moment. Um, there are controversies around uh, the extent to which businesses have a right to sort of own and claim proprietorship over the knowledge that they produce. Um, again, a sort of conflict that's been, or controversy that's been very, very live during the COVID pandemic. Um, and at a sort of deeper level, I think sort of conflicts around what sort of knowledge we should value, you know, and I think, you know, sort of populism um, and sort of anti-establishment, anti-system politics have been driven partly by a, by, by a sense that some forms of knowledge, um, not the knowledge often uh, held by um, ordinary people uh, are, are prized less than others. The professional knowledge that, you know, that um, uh, academic knowledge is prized more than um, embodied knowledge, uh, the sort of craft knowledge, um, you know, knowing that is valued more than knowing, <clears throat> knowing how, that, um, that human capital, and we've seen a big increase uh, in the value of human, the economic value of human capital, but actually that also leads to sort of cultural capital and that our cities have become, um, you know, uh, we've almost seen this sort of, what, what's the language I want? The, the, the um, uh, living in a city gives you access to sort of cultural capital, you know, in a way that it, that it didn't in the, in the past. Um, so in the background to all of this is, is uh, the way in which this knowledge economy has become, um, more central to our economies uh, and a sort of, yeah, more valuable economic and political asset. Um, and I think it's true to say that, you know, knowledge has just become, you know, increasingly important and, and come to play, or has a potentially an, an increasingly important role to play in um, addressing the sort of huge, critical uh, global challenges that we face above all around climate change. And we know that, you know, in all of these controversies and in all of the sort of the, the, the increasing sort of importance and, and economic, as I say, and, and political and other values to our knowledge that cities and universities are absolutely central players in all of this. They shape the knowledge that's been produced, who gets to share it, how it's disseminated, um, uh, which is why, you know, we're having today's discussions. <clears throat> And that wasn't, you know, it's certainly the case in my lifetime that I've, you know, I've seen, I mean, clearly the, the number of students who are studying have, have gone up. Um, city universities, I think, have become sort of more important within the sort of the, the, the galaxy of, of, of universities. Um, and I've absolutely no doubt that sort of city university partnerships will become increasingly important to um, the development of cities and, um, and their success or otherwise. So we're going to be talking about these issues. I'm going to be talking about them particularly in the context of or in relation to London, uh, Paris and Berlin. And I'm now going to introduce 
our three speakers. Um, so first, in the order in which they're going to speak, um, Professor Joe, uh, Joe Beale, who's a colleague of mine at LSE Cities. Um, she is Distinguished Research Fellow uh, at the LSE, um, Distinguished Policy Fellow at the Academy of Sciences. Um, she spent uh, much of her childhood in, in South Africa, um, and she has been uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor at the University of Cape Town, and uh, her academic work is focused in particularly on uh, cities in conflict, on sort of gender dimensions of, of, of um, cities, and on um, uh, higher education. So extremely well qualified to um, contribute to today's discussion. Then we have Jean-Louis Missica, who is also another, and this is not, I promise you, a sort of stitcher, but also, is also, uh, she's visiting fellow at LEC Cities, and he was formerly um, member of the Council of Paris and deputy mayor for urban planning, architecture, greater Paris, economic development, and attractiveness. So that seems to me a sort of pretty, <laughs> pretty important <laughs> brief. I don't know what everyone else did. Um, and he is uh, currently, um, I believe, director of Terra Nova, which is uh, France's leading progressive think tank, and has recently published a really interesting book um, uh, called The Business of Hate about um, about sort of social media um, and the role of, um, of our media in um, you know, provoking, stirring up um, division, uh, fake news, um, and the rest of it. And finally, Benjamin Forrester Baldenius, who is a, uh, a freelance architect, um, founder and chair of the Floating University in Berlin, uh, 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 and a professor of architecture um, who particularly works on um, developing and realizing uh, public installations in, in cities, um, works with obviously with the, with, the, with the mayor of Berlin, but also across other cities, and, and um, is particularly inter interested in sort of interdisciplinarity and inter interdisciplinary practice. So as I say, three um, extremely sort of well-qualified speakers. Uh, the way this is gonna work is I'm gonna invite each speaker to speak for 10, no more than 15 minutes. Um, um, present their point of view, their experience, their thoughts. Uh, we will follow up with a, um, a discussion uh, between the four of us. I'll pose some, some, some questions and then we'll leave lots of time for um, all of you in the, in the audience to um, add, your, uh, add your questions and I will, um, I will uh, address those to our speakers. So do please start um, uh, you know, using the, the Q&A feature. Um, I should also just uh, acknowledge our uh, the people who have made today possible, the people who have brought it all together, organized this. So we've got ICR Research, uh, the British Council in, in um, Germany, the British Council in France, uh, the Institute of London, um, the, sorry, <laughs> the Institute of, uh, sorry, University of London Institute in Paris, I should know that one, that's my institution, uh, the Goethe Institute and uh, Queen Mary University of London. So unless I've, unless I've missed out on anything, and so far I haven't, I don't think I've seen a note to me saying um, I've missed something out, um, uh, I will, um, I'm gonna hand over to Joe first of all, to sort of set the scene. As I say, Joe's written a number of um, papers uh, and full I know books on city uh, diplomacy. So Joe, over to you. Thank you very much, Ben. And thank you um, to all of you for having me and inviting me to speak on a, topic that uh, is very close to my heart, both um, as someone who was in universities for a long time and then in the British Council for eight years where I, where I led our work on international higher education and cultural engagement. And so the whole issue of knowledge diplomacy is something that I was involved in very much at a, at a level of thought and activity. And I thought the most useful thing I could do in setting the scene is say a little bit about the whole concept of um, knowledge diplomacy and then how I think it relates to cities. And then my colleagues on the panel who know a huge amount more than I do um, on, on cities and operationalizing some of these ideas, uh, I will hand over and um, give them more time. So if we look at the concept of knowledge diplomacy in its very formal and now quite dated sense, um, it was understood in relation to trade agreements and, inter and international intellectual property rights. And that became entrenched as the world became um, dependent on economic diversification around knowledge economies. And 
right from the off. Some cities, notably the city-state of Singapore, uh, brought these two together in national development plans. Um, the notion of knowledge diplomacy, though, um, has become tied up with soft power and organizations like Goethe, like um, the British Council are very much organizations constructed for the dissemination and practice of soft power, which is understood as using influence, attraction, persuasion to develop good social relations across international borders rather than co coercion and force. Um, and it's a controversial topic from the time Joseph Nye first uh, spoke of it. Um, but it's very much part of uh, the lexicon of international relations, and it has a huge body of activity um, underneath and around it. And knowledge diplomacy is absolutely intrinsic uh, to soft power and vice versa. And knowledge diplomacy would include research, collaboration, academic exchange, international higher education, and engagement working across borders. And for the most part, it's a good thing. It seeks solutions to address critical global challenges like the pandemic, climate change, and as the paper uh, behind this seminar um, speaks to, you know, why wouldn't you want knowledge diplomacy, knowledge creation and exchange across borders? Um, but it's not a neutral concept. It implies positive outcomes, but it doesn't necessarily um, affect them. There are, as Ben said in his introduction, there are power relations at stake, uh, conflict over who controls the intellectual canon, um, the whole call that's going on in universities at the moment to decolonize the curriculum is very much part of that grappling with those power relations which cross international borders. But from the point of view of cities, I think one of the critical issues that we need to engage with is um, that most definitions and applications of knowledge diplomacy don't include the full range of actors involved or skew, to use another of Ben's words, the importance of those actors who are involved. So universities are regularly uh, seen as part of knowledge diplomacy. Higher education has a long and rich history of scholarly exchange from the time some scholar first walked from Bologna to Berlin or across the steppes of China and Mongolia to confer. Uh, but it's changed a lot. And scholarly engagement in the 21st century is different from 100 years ago. Um, it's been facilitated by communication, it's been disadvantaged by competition. It's particularly been economized. And if you look at the, uh, the way in which international students have been um, commodified, if you like, this is one area where a key element of how cities and uh, universities and sites of knowledge creation come together it's around international students. And the economists would often see them as contributing fees, paying rents, spending money in the city, contributing to the economic development and attractiveness of a city, but sometimes the rest is forgotten. Now the best of cities uh, pay a great deal of attention to this. And you know, there's a, a lot of competition to get into the top 10 or top however many of the QS survey on the best cities to be a student in. And I'm happy to say that London, Paris and Berlin have all been in the top 10. Um, but there are many other cities competing to get there. And to do so, it's about providing a city that creates an environment where students want to be. They want to enjoy the culture, they want to enjoy the vibe, they want to enjoy the public space, the public realm. And if the public realm is, as uh, Richard Sennett describes it, a place where strangers meet, then cities that are bright and focused and have their eye on this ball are going to make the, uh, the public realm a place where people do want to meet. 
So um, I'm not going to say a lot more because I don't want to take a lot more time, uh, but just to conclude by saying that cities can do this. Uh, they can create an image of a city uh, that is going to attract students, make them enjoy it while they're there, make it a place they want to return to because of the social relations they build while a student in the city. And that's part of the soft power long-term uh, knowledge diplomacy the, and the cultural diplomacy. Um, but I, I just want to conclude by saying cities are also built on people and you can't advertise yourself out of crises. So if cities or the nations of which they're part are not going to provide that kind of environment, that kind of public space, uh, that kind of opportunity for people to come together and to engage, then no amount of um, promotion or city diplomacy is going to turn them into places that people will believe in and want to come to. You're on mute, Ben. Really, you, you think I would have learned by now, I, I do apologize. Um, that raises lots of questions. I mean, questions about the relationship between, I guess, um, uh, cultural diplomacy, which is perhaps more typically um, uh, the, 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 the terms in which organizations like the Goethe Institute perhaps or, or the British Council are described and, and knowledge diplomacy. Um, uh, some questions about um, how cities and um, universities sort of work together. Um, you know, the role of the role of universities in you know, advancing sort of national as opposed to um, you know, international or, or you know, neutral um, agendas, all of which we might come back to. But I think I think we'll just go now straight over to, to um, Jean-Louis uh, Masika, who um, uh, I know, I mean, he can talk to us about so many things, but I'm very much hoping you would talk to us a bit about your, your time in Paris. You were associated then with doing a great deal, Jean-Louis, to um, sort of recast that city's um, innovation economy and to sort of try and create something which, which was a bit more sort of bottom up. Um, a bit more perhaps sort of open and, and, and inclusive. Um, and I'd be interested in knowing a bit more about the, sort of the role of universities, uh, Paris's universities in, in, in played all, you know, all of that, what your reflections are on how it all worked, what worked, what didn't, but also any other more general thoughts you have. And, and including, I'm going to be very interesting, I'm sure the, we'll have questions on this if we don't address it now, on your, your new book on the business of hate and um, uh, and the way in which our sort of media um, have been transformed over the last 20 years. Jean-Louis. Well, thank you very much for this, uh, for this invitation. And uh, as far as uh, this, this question of, uh, of knowledge di diplomacy and the role of knowledge in the governance of, uh, of cities is vast, uh, uh, it can be approached. Uh, in many ways. So I, I, I had to make a choice and uh, my choice uh, is, is this one. Uh, I've chosen to deal uh, with it uh, from the point of view of, uh, of the data revolution uh, in the governance of cities and more particularly uh, uh, of mobility. Urban mobility is, uh, is more and more data driven and it is interesting uh, to explore the stakes of this knowledge revolution. The production of, uh, of a mass of data, we speak about uh, big data and uh, uh, it's uh, the, 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 the right words uh, to, to describe the, the quantity of information which is produced every day uh, on, uh, on mobility. This uh, production of, of a mass of data will very quickly uh, raise the problem of who have uh, access to this data and, uh, and for what purpose. The sharing and uh, analysis of data will be a key factor uh, in the organization of the city and in the protection of general interest uh, in the city. Many private actors uh, will claim uh, legitimacy to manage these platforms uh, or we refuse uh, to share the information produced by their services 
for reasons of competition or confidentiality. It is clear that a private uh, operator with a dominant position in urban transportation will have more political rights uh, than the mayor of the city. Can public authorities negotiate data sharing uh, with private players or should they oblige them by law to do so? On this subject, more than, other, than any other, the question of the new diplomacy of cities will arise. Big cities will either build a common strategy and form a common front against uh, Uber, Lyft, Google, Amazon, Apple, Tesla, and all the transport or service operators, or they will be devoured by these powerful global players. If cities want to play a role in this revolution, they must become aware of the political stakes today in order to build the regulatory tools that will enable them to guide the strategies of private players. They will have to define clear rules of the game sufficiently in advance for these players to accept them, integrate them, and adapt their investment and economic models. It is a common place to say the data is the oil of the 21st century. Data is fundamental to improving the services offered to users and stimulating innovation. But its value also and above all comes from the way it is shared. It is the sharing of data between its producers and other actors that will generate new services and wealth. Local authorities are beginning to size the logic induced by the generalization of interfaces and particularly open APIs by creating local urban data platforms. They are setting up registers that collect data on urban services from their administrations, but also uh, from the public services they manage and sometimes even from private operators. But private platforms knowingly keep a veil over data that is necessary for the general interest. The Parisian uh, open data strategy is based on a conscious choice in favor of a logic of reciprocity. The data are free to access even for commercial users, but the user undertakes to maintain the same freedom of access to the database, even if it has re reworked it. The city has chosen the ODBL Open Database License for this purpose. This license is used in particular for the data produced in OpenStreetMap, the cartographic database produced by voluntary contributions throughout the world. The law for a digital republic adopted in October 2016 is one of the first laws in the world to consider the concept of public interest data. The challenge is that is to no longer judge data according to its producer, mainly public data versus private data, but according to its use and the interest it may have for the community. This will make it possible to provide access to a certain amount of data that is privatized and which because it is of general interest will have to be put into the common pot in the, log in the logic of reciprocity. Every, everyone know uh, now that mobility as a service is a platform for sharing mobility data that makes intermodality between several modes of transport possible. Mobility as a service allows the user with a single application to access different urban transport modes with a single payment method instead of several ticketing operations. To meet a customer demand, a mass operator can offer several tra transport options, be it public transport, carpooling, taxi, car, or bike sharing services or access to a car park. Mass is therefore also an algorithm that will influence transport supply and demand according to the rules that will be assigned to it. Finally, thanks to the large amount of data collected, Mass makes it possible to know and predict journey times, cost, and associate externalities like pollution or congestion in a very precise manner. To enrich the open source database, it is also possible to encourage 
citizen data portability to allow and encourage each citizen to decide on the use she wishes to make of her personal data, in particular when it concerns her mobility on her smartphone or linked to the vehicle she uses. This information could be very useful for statistical work on travel patterns. A sufficiently large sample of citizens who authorize the reuse of their data would allow the survey to be updated in real time. The data of users who give permission could be shared anonym anonymously for the benefit of a certain mobility operators in order to limit the barriers to entry posed by the accumulation of user data. Such a policy can reduce monopoly situations and promote competition for the benefit of responsible companies. City diplomacy must still progress in order to invent real re regulatory tools share, shared by all local governments. They will have to put collective pressure on mobility services to transmit their data of general interest. They will have to work together to produce mobility operating systems so that mass platform meets the expectation of the residents of the city. With data-driven mobility, city diplomacy will be confronted with its first major issue, a real test. Either a coalition of cities in sufficient numbers will agree on common rules of the game, despite differences in national legislation, and will manage to get them accepted by global private players and nation states that are reluctant to accept this new diplomacy, of course, or these powerful private players will take control of the new urban mobility and they will control the city, therefore. In digital technologies, the innovator has always been one step ahead of the regulator. A shared governance of data-driven mobility creates very special conditions for the redeployment of innovation because for the first time, the regulator can define the framework and rules while the innovation is still in gestation. It must, it must take advantage of this opportunity to build a common ground, to impose mobility as a service, to promote access for all to means of transport and to design a range of diversified and current services. <clears throat> this requires the sharing of data, the interoperability of platforms and the creation of a new form of governance in which all stakeholders participate in the decision making and management of mobility. Uh, in this condition, we can design the city as a new platform. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. No, that was that was extremely interesting. <clears throat> just just one question to begin with, which is, I mean, how hopeful are you that we will see this cooperation between cities, this regulatory, you know, cooperation? I mean, are you seeing it already? Who should we be looking to to? To lead it, I mean, are there networks out there already which are beginning to do this work? Well, you have you have you have global networks of cities like C40, for example. And uh, for example, when I was in charge, when I, when I was a, 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 mayor, a deputy mayor, uh, uh, I participated uh, to uh, uh, seminars uh, from the C40, uh, specifically uh, focused on this uh, on this question: uh, what kind of uh, rules of the game we can design uh, uh, in order to negotiate with big actors like uh, uh, Google or, uh, uh, or Tesla. <clears throat> uh, but you have also uh, specific coalitions uh, designed on the question of, for example, uh, 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 self-driving vehicles uh, and, uh, and, and what kind of uh, mass platform uh, cities can can design. My, my my position on this question is that it's not possible to create specific mass platform city by city because uh, uh, it's impossible to compete uh, in, in at this level at the level of the city with global actors. So the cities have to design uh, a set of rules, a global set of rules, and to organize. The, uh, the interoperability of uh, mass of mass uh, platforms, and and this is the main subject of conversation 
uh, in the new diplomacy of cities. Right, very interesting. I, I suppose I would be put, um, I'm thinking particularly about uh, the future of mo mobility and, and, and technology. Um, I think the biggest threat actually to our ideas of sort of urbanity um, come from a slightly different direction, which is self-drive cars. And um, you know, it is certainly the case that in cities like the cities around the table today, Paris, London, and Berlin, old European cities with narrow streets and um, which are pedestrian and cycle friendly, they won't work for self-drive cars unless we ban pedestrians and the cyclists from the roads. And I have heard privately the self-drive car operators talk about pedestrians as obstacles. Because the second, the second you, you know, the second you you, you can cycle in front of a, a car and know it will stop instantly because it's self-drive, or the second that you know you've you've got kids and you know they can run out in front of, the, of, a, of a car, it will stop. The roads become unnavigable for for, for, for self-drive cars, and and I think we're going to have to fight quite hard. And I think the pressure will mount as self-drive technology um, gets more refined. I think that we'll have to fight quite hard, as I say, to, I can, I mean, I know there'll be pressure to introduce jaywalking laws. There'll be pressure to say that you can only cross a road uh, at a, at a, um, at a, you know, traffic light when it, when, when, when the pedestrian um, sign is, is green. I mean, that is, you know, that is, that is going to come down very soon. And I think you're absolutely right. The cities are going to have to speak together on this with one voice otherwise they'll sort of be picked off um one by one and i'll also say that i think actually that the three cities um gathered here today are particularly important in this because they are seen you know along with the sort of you know not that not the only ones but actually it's a relatively small handful i mean one would definitely add barcelona to that and perhaps new york you know as as, as places which other cities look to um for inspiration and as a sort of lead into how they should do things. You know, I'm always looking at what's going on in Paris, what's going on in Ber Berlin, what's going on in Barcelona. And I think, you know, you're looking at London. Um, so, you know, we, we particularly have to get these things uh, as, right as, as right as we can. Benjamin, um, uh, over to you. I think, Benjamin, you're gonna show us some, some slides, give us a bit of sort of visual stimulation. Yes, uh, yes, I'm, hello, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I'm, I, I can be in this esteemed ground, uh, and I'm already very curious, Ben, how you will bring these different strings <laughs> together that we uh, that we did. Oh, it's easy. The, uh, Zoom call uh, the, um, the the traffic databases, the uh, the knowledge diplomacy of universities, and now me, uh, and I will I will try to um, bring it all down to because that's all that I can actually because I'm. I, of course, I've studied, but I, I I don't declare myself an academic. So I'm. I'm and and Benjamin, I'm will very, you just Benjamin, will you do a slightly better job than I did of introducing yourself as well? But perhaps you're going to do that. But if you're not, will you just say, um, uh, you know, who you do? Yeah, I will. I will. I, I will bring this uh, discussion a bit down to a kind of eye level by just uh, showing what we're doing and who we are, uh, because I'm just one out of several let me open up my slideshow uh, i am working in a in a collective and this collective is called raumlabor which translates as space laboratory maybe uh, and uh we, we've been working together we're nine architects we've been working together for nine years and uh, now for, for more than 20 years now uh on uh, something that uh, for uh, couple of years now we know uh, is called urban practice. Before that, it was, we were always discussing more like, uh, 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 we, 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 we didn't really know what, what, what this field is that we're working in because we were kind of denying uh, the traditional architecture approach of uh, uh, with this reflex of uh, there is, um, there's a question and the answer is a building. Uh, we, um, we are very much, um, persuaded that um, that space is not the product of the real estate market, but sta space is the product of social interaction, um, and uh, this is why we live that already in our in the way that we work. So we, what you see here is the group uh, maybe ten years ago, 
my, my friends and colleagues uh, that I share this kind of platform, an office, a website uh, with, but not a company because uh, we, have, we could never decide to be one economic uh, entity. We are, we are, we are nine uh, single entrepreneurs and sometimes we, found we, we, we start a small company together for a project and then we cancel it again because we like to be independent. Um, also when we make our taxes and when we decide when we want to go on holidays and when, when we want to um, concentrate on work. Now, uh, so these are my colleagues, uh, but these are also my colleagues. So whenever we dive into a project, the, the group expands and we start working with all kinds of people. May that be craftsmen or, or people that know a lot of things that we don't know, like, um, I don't know, about planting and agriculture or about uh, welding and, and taking apart old cars or, uh, uh, or um, all kinds of issues. Also, you know, so these are, uh, we're, we're, we're kind of a hub for knowledge exchange, maybe you could say in this sense. But what we're also doing is we, we build these small kind of tools for action that can go into the city and be, and create a space of encounter that maybe um, that maybe the city in this particular position needs for its um, as say site specific knowledge. So we create a space for site specific knowledge, but also for situated knowledge by uh, by blowing these kind of inflatables into spaces that um, that you couldn't really use as a um, as a space of encounter before. And then we create an atmosphere. I'd say in this case, it's, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a, a feast, a kitchen, a, a dinner. Uh, in this case, it's a workshop to build uh, chairs and, and, and other objects. In this case, it's a classroom. And, uh, and here it's uh, mainly a place to discuss a, a culture festival that should arrive in the city of Anyang in South Korea uh, uh, in the same year. So we, uh, we develop these, um, these mobile objects that you could say are part of the, become part of the, uh, the mobility of the city. You know, it's a mo mobile item that uh, then can, uh, can enter a space and then open up the back door and unroll this huge plastic bag that then with a very simple and very analog uh, uh, technique can be blown up and used for all kinds of um, uh, needs. But the way that we, uh, that we make it, because we're, you know, Germany is very well known for its beer tents, but we're, it, for us, this is not just a beer tent, not just a place for people to come together and drink, but it's a space that is actually a space of exchange and goes to um, these places where exchange is, is really needed. Okay, so this is, this is one of the things that we do, but as I just have a little bit of time, I skip very quickly. Um, uh, I, I, I take a few steps forward and I leave out a few um, few um, moments of um, of uh, learning in our process, and I explain to you a small project that we've been running for four years now. That's called the Floating University. It has a very prominent position. It's in the middle of Berlin, beside the temple, former Temple of Airport, which is this half moon shaped uh, building that you see on the left, the biggest, still the biggest building in Europe, and the blue kind of triangle with round edges is the rainwater retention basin of the uh, sealed area of the airport. So all the rainwater on storm, stormy days with a lot of rain goes into this basin and the basin looks very, very attractive. It's just um, that nobody uh, really knew it was there because it was very hidden away. Of course, it's nine meter below the street level and, uh, and it has a fence around it and a ring of trees um, to protect it from the sights of others. When we discovered it, it looked like that. And we thought that, hmm, maybe this could be a site uh, for, uh, for 
a, a, a learning environment where we can learn something about the resources and the ecology of the city. And we uh, proposed to build a, um, a light temporary structure in it that um, then becomes a place of exchange on many, many levels, and especially on the level of kind of artistic practices that try to infiltrate or contaminate uh, the people that are taking part in, uh, in the programs uh, that can be workshops and lectures and so on. And, uh, and, uh, and after three years of very hard diplomacy with the city, we were able to use this public infrastructure um, to, uh, to build, actually build our dream in it and, uh, and open it up to the public. Now, this is, uh, this is the floating university in 2018. Now it looks a bit different, but it, the, the idea stayed the same. It's a place where we invite on one side universities to come with their students and learn about the city water, especially of course, rainwater, uh, the pollution of water, uh, like Donna Haraway says, we have to stay with the trouble. What we have around, well, what we have in front of us is polluted rainwater that goes into the river uh, and uh, that, um, that needs filtration, but isn't filtered. So uh, we, 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 we look at this water that is not being used for anything in the city, even though we know that there's, there will be water so shortages coming in the future. And we connect this place with the knowledge that is on one side around the city and the academic world, and also outside the city in the, in, in the world of academia to invite um, professors and their students to, um, to come and make their, um, their seminars here. Now, making a seminar in a structure like that is, uh, is quite, um, quite a, um, a, a thing to do because it's super difficult to concentrate. Uh, you are outside, you're struck by the weather, there's dragonflies and mosquitoes and ducks coming by. Uh, there's, uh, you know, nature is around you and, uh, and, and also you can see everything that is there because it's a space without walls. It's a space that um, sometimes dries out and looks like a desert and, uh, and that um, uh, changes the color constantly because the, the algae in the water, the water is only 10 centimeter high, so it heats up very fast and, uh, and produces a lot of algae that then lies down on the ground and so on and so on. So it's a, it's a, it's a super active place that, um, uh, that, uh, that by, being the way that it is and having the architecture on it that it provides um, is also contaminating every discourse that you have. Um, and we, what we found out by working in this, in this place with uh, you know, an immatriculation looking like this um, and, and, and trying to concentrate on super important topics uh, uh, that, uh, that actually are the, the probably the most relevant questions that we can ask in our times, we, uh, we found out that this is actually the best place for transdisciplinary learning because you have all, not all, but many different forms of knowledge coming together. You have, uh, of course, you have the, 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 the academic knowledge, the, the, the knowledge that's being produced um, through uh, research and, and scientific thinking, and then usually finds it, its outputs by, by, by words and words put on paper. But you also have the knowledge that comes with the site. So you have the site-specific knowledge that, uh, that, um, that is brought by the water coming in, by, by, by the birds and the weather. Um, you have the situated knowledge by always kind of new groups and random mixtures of students, teachers, but also artists and neighbors uh, coming with their kids um, that, um, uh, that produce a, a very diverse learning environment. And, uh, and 
you have um, that, yeah, and the, 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 this, this atmosphere of learning creates a, a kind of an, a, a situation where nobody really knows how to react. And this makes everybody kind of on eye level. So even if Jane Randall is talking very, very interesting and smart things, she starts being on eye level with everybody else because everybody is kind of disorganized and, and has to reassemble his thoughts. If uh, you, know, you can sit, uh, sit around the pool and, uh, and, 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 and suddenly really, it's not like us, here sitting on this computer exchanging by looking all at, at a screen. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a situation where even a normal architectural presentation becomes kind of awkward because, um, because it's not in the holy halls of the university. So we what we found out is that by doing all these kinds of different workshops with different kinds of people that have different outcomes um, is that uh, uh, a situation where everyone um, has to adjust newly to uh, is uh, is actually the best ground for um, for trying to for the struggle to find a new language that uh, everybody speaks. And this, combined with uh, with cultural um, uh, and and uh, forms, uh, with artistic forms, with you know, music that doesn't need this music is music for music it is super easy to adjust to a space like that for uh for all kinds of embodied art forms for performance for uh for, for these things it's super easy to find a language that everybody uh works with and here we can get inspired by the you know really the knowledge of of artists and and art forms and uh and different uh uh, and even, even people that dance with bicycles and, uh, and, uh, and by walking around the water with rubber boots, uh, you can even start you know, new forms of philosophic uh, exchanges. So here we go, sometimes it rains uh, and then we get flooded as well. Uh, and we have to adjust to that. I just skip a few photos. We have a kids university. Of course, so everybody can also get inspired by the kids that collect stories that they find by tracing things in the basin. Uh, they collect a lot of things and photographs and form stories out of that and then get told to, uh, to grown ups and, uh, and they analyze the algae and uh, learn a lot of things. And all this creates a, a super big network of different actors and different roles that different people pay play in, in, in this whole kind of universe of knowledge production that is, um, if I, I, if I when, when I look at academia, it's, it's a very hierarchical, still a very hierarchical world, even though uh, everybody is part of the organization of it. But, but here we were, we're really struggling with this kind of uh, uh, flat hierarchy of knowledge production. Uh, and try to um, to give uh, a voice to everyone. And now I even open up this to the city. Uh, what you see is the um, the floating university is in the center. Um, and what you see here is a map uh, that was created last year by um, an an office, uh, an initiative that has just been founded in Berlin. That is an even even bigger network. Of places like the floating university, because Berlin, of course, is not um, is a place where a lot of people can come and can afford, uh, still afford a living that cannot afford their living in London and Paris. Uh, that uh, that means it's still a very attractive. And here, maybe this is the word that brings us together uh, together, just as a hint to Ben, <laughs> attractiveness. <laughs> we have the mayor of attractiveness, and we have uh, Joe Biel. Uh, um, saying that it how important it is that a city is attractive now here's berlin uh, and uh, for many reasons attractive city but also attractive because it has all these places that create different forms of knowledge and that um where a lot of initiatives come together and these initiatives 
were able last year in the corona crisis to form a new network that's called the, um, the Initiative for Urban Practice uh, that has, um, has now an office and an exchange platform. We are meeting on a constant basis. We have formed an association and we even form a political voice now to um, make pressure, pr pressure on the different urban uh, administration um, uh, uh, um, um, administration ch chapters no uh, um, well the the different mayors <laughs> so the cultural mayor as well as the um, development mayor uh, to maybe find a way to collaborate on something that is both cultural and uh, and a city development tool. Uh, and uh, and maybe and that's the next thing that we'll be working on is also the environmental mayor to come together because it is also about sustainability and um, and all these topics. Benjamin, this is it for now. Thank you, thank, thank you very much. That was that, that was so stimulating, um, really, really really wonderful. And I mean, I'm going to try and knit these things together. And actually, I think it's going to be much less hard than than you, than you think. And you've been very helpful because I think what your what you've sort of shown us is an illustration of a much broader trend to promote and support in cities, um, you know, a sort of new way of doing research and innovation and ultimately sort of you know, policy development, which is you know, much more inclusive, connected, interdisciplinary, and also often sort of bottom up in the way that it involves not just experts or academic experts and academic policymakers, but, um, but, but, but citizens and, and civil society. And, and where the approach is very much around um, not just sort of crowdsourcing ideas, but also sort of trying things out, experimenting. Um, you know, the inspiration is is not so much the sort of um, academic um, lecture, but the sort of you know the sort of the hackathon, um, uh, the sort of you know the the, the, the sand pit, um, and uh, and you know across Europe in particular, you've seen. I think I think I saw a survey which identified more than two hundred and twenty policy labs that have been set up across European cities. And this is actually something I associate particularly with, with you, Jean-Louis, in, in Paris, that you, you made a real effort to sort of open up space, you know, innovative spaces to give access to you know, entrepreneurs, I guess both business entrepreneurs, but also sort of social entrepreneurs, and to sort of crowdsource solutions, um, particularly around sort of local places and regeneration sites is that right i mean am I, am I right in associating that with with your your time in paris you're on mute jean louis i think uh you are right uh, uh the the uh, what is interesting in this uh, uh different uh, presentation is uh, to show the, the diversity of, uh, uh, of of the vision of the city as a as a knowledge city and uh, and uh, the question of uh, of knowledge diplomacy and uh, you're right to insist on uh, uh, one point which is for me very important is that expertise is also uh, the expertise of the of the citizen it's also the the expertise of the of the user for example in my in my presentation, uh, when I, 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 I spoke about the portability of the data of the, of the users, uh, it's exactly uh, the, the subject of how can their expertise of, of using uh, a mobility tool uh, can be shared and, uh, and the sharing of, the, of this information uh, give uh, uh, the city and all the citizen uh, uh, the uh, uh, an improvement of the quality of life and, and, and of the quality of, uh, uh, of mobility. And, and what Benjamin was, was speaking of uh, is something like that. You know, it's, of course, it's very different because uh, it's, not, it's not data which are, which are, are, are shared, but uh, uh, information, knowledge, uh, uh, analysis, uh, uh, critical analysis, 
but it's the same uh, the same idea uh, behind. Uh, it means that if you if you get the students outside of the of their of their universities and 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 you uh, and you mix uh, uh, different uh, uh, users of the city, uh, you can produce a, a new kind of knowledge, and this new kind of knowledge is fundamentally different uh, of the tra traditional knowledge, the, ex the expert knowledge. You know? And, and Jean-Louis, you just, just give us a quick a quick flavor of, of how you did this in Paris, because I mean, I know you were crowdsourcing um, well, ideas we, for, 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 for some of the sort of regeneration. Yes, um, we, we, I can give some example. For example, the, uh, the innovation strategy of the city was a, a bottom-up uh, uh, strategy. We, we didn't say uh, we want to create incubators on this subject. Uh, we organized tender and we say to people uh, uh, specialized in innovation, uh, on, which, on which subject do you want to create a, 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 an incubator or an accelerator? And after that, uh, we, we try to mix uh, uh, this proposal, which were generally uh, created by people outside the universities. And we ask universities, uh, do you agree to, uh, to give uh, some, some room, some place inside the university? Uh, to this project, which is very interesting and, and could be uh, connected with uh, uh, this one or this one uh, research laboratory. So uh, uh, the, uh, this is why I, I am speaking uh, uh, about the city as a platform, because we act like a platform. We say we have universities, we have research laboratories, we have some people who are uh, leaders in the, in the field of innovation, and, and, the, and the role of the city is to connect these people together and to yeah. these people working together and sometimes sometimes to discover uh, one another because uh, the, the system is is so uh, rigid yeah. then, 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 then people ignore uh, the existence. For example, when we launch our uh, uh, um, uh, competition reinventing Paris, uh, we organize uh, meetings uh, of uh, real estate professional and uh, startups uh, in order uh, for the real estate professional to discover, because they did not know that, to discover that they, 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 there is a lot of startups in the field of uh, building and uh, architecture and, uh, and real estate. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was very interesting because in our competition, we make it uh, uh, um, uh, compulsory to uh, to organize a pluridisciplinary uh, a team. For example, uh, the real estate developer was obliged, of course, to come with an architect, but also uh, with designers, startups, uh, researchers, sociologists, economists, uh, uh, and, and so on. So creating these uh, uh, pluridisciplinary teams uh, was a, a way to reinvent the, the, the building of the city, the, the fabric of the city. Brilliant. Joe, I'm sorry I've left you out, but I'm now, now, now turning to you and, and I'm sure you'll have reflections uh, as I do on, on what you've heard. Um, I mean, I'd be particularly interested in, I mean, you know, in whether you um, see this sort of same sort of, you know, experiment, experimental cross-disciplinary and sometimes sort of bottom-up approaches in universities um, you know, in the global south and, 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 and also other cities in the global south that you've, you're familiar with and you've studied. Um, and I guess you know, any other reflections you might have, but also the sort of question, not necessarily for now, but for some point about going back to sort of city diplomacy, you know, are, are there um, international partnerships, you know, involving cities and universities, which you think are really exemplary and, and which we can learn from? So Joe, over to you. Okay, so there's quite a lot in there. And I, I, I found lots of connections actually between what uh, Benjamin and Jean-Louis were saying. Um, and, and they relate to the point that you can't advertise yourself out of problems. You have to be who you are. So be Berlin couldn't be be Berlin if it didn't facilitate some of the things like the floating university. Although I recognize that you said there was hard diplomacy to get what you wanted. 
So there has to be an authenticity about it. And then in terms of what Jean-Louis was talking about, it's the relationship between cities and the international. So that's the part that I've mostly been focused on. And it's really difficult when you conventionally look at public space or physical space in cities and then Google uh, changes the game and raises the temperature and the level at which um, public space then operates and what do cities do there? So I really appreciated uh, Jean-Louis' points in that respect. And I think for me, you know, you can have a hundred hackathons or you can have lots of rebellions amongst mayors against Google, but how do you join it all up into something that either for an individual city or a network of cities, you can tackle the global sphere and make a, make a difference? And, you know, it comes back to who, who curates the hackathons, who curates the public space, who curates the protest, who, who curates the disruptive activities that go to make this interesting citizen alive city. And, you know, there are lots of examples um, and it depends whose interests are being advanced. And if I can just rush through a few examples, Ben, if you take LSE, our, or one of your universities, one of mine, um, LSE prides itself on its physical location between the financial centre of the City of London, Westminster, the London School of Economics and Political Science, and it promotes itself on that basis, okay? You take PSL, University of PSL in Paris. It was a, a group of really highly productive uh, uh, and influential and famous institutions, but that were small. And it's been a very difficult a process of banging heads together in some senses, dangling carrots in another to get all these institutions like the Marie Curie Institute and the Grand École to come together in PSL, which is now in the top 50 universities in the world. And it has a physical presence on the left bank and it has students wanting to identify not just with uh, Paris Chemie, but also with PSL uh, and Paris. So that's another way you can create and um, the city of the media presence, which has worked together very well. It was, uh, you know, around issues like climate change, bringing in British aerospace one and, and, and uh, the media industry very closely together around issues of sustainability, but they have now come together around the promotion of the SDGs as a city, as an intellectual community. And that word sustainability has brought together really competing uh, confrontational social actors from commercial private sector actors to the poorest people being represented through very radical community organizations. And through that, uh, the work of Sean Fox at University of Bristol, who's been do doing action research with them has shown that, you know, Bristol from being kind of not on the radar is now invited to GTZ meetings in Berlin and is talking about its climate action agenda. It's talking to the UN, it's um, becoming international through a process of knowledge diplomacy that's not just based on usual academic um, research. Not, not as radical as what Benjamin was talking about, but some of that real social engagement. And then my last example would be a city like Medellin in Colombia, which is, was known as the birthplace and playground of Paulo Escobar and the narco traffickers. And through, and this is where city government made the difference. Uh, Sergio Fajada, as a really innovative mayor of Medellin and then governor of Antioquia province, using international connections as well as engaged social action with the poorest of the city and technology and 
planning with, with the barriers uh, being linked by, um, to the center of the city by different transport systems, all of that um, has led to Medellin winning international prizes and changing its profile internationally for the benefit of its citizens. So uh, the short thing is who curates, how, how do they curate and who do they involve in the process? It comes down to something uh, like that. And I didn't mention the knowledge quarter of University of London, which I should have been, but maybe you can say something about that. Otherwise, I'm happy to add that onto the list. Um, um, first of all, I'm going to encourage our audience to um, ask some questions. We've only got, got, got one um, so far. Uh, and I mean, you know, we're, um, we are seeing, you know, across London, um, the popping up of these sort of you know, innovation districts, often with the universities at their hearts, probably the most established of which is the Knowledge Quarter, which is the one in, in Bloomsbury, you know, around um, UCL, University of London, uh, Birkbeck, so as the British Museum, um, the Wellcome Institute, and I, I mean, the, the more the more I mention, the, the more the more offence I'll cause to any that I that I leave out, um, which are you know now increasingly I think you know working with uh, the local councils, um, with local employers and, and businesses, uh, with um, and with, with with civil society, the, the sort of some of the groups that you know you, you've mentioned, you know, representing because we still have in this you know central district in in a, in a great global city actually some of the poorest <laughs> poorest parts of of London. I mean, uh, in Paris the banlieue are around the outside, but I will say in, in London the Paris some of the banlieue are actually you know just they they they, they just run in a sort of arc, um, more or less from sort of Notting Hill Gate all the way around to the sort of to to, to the city or to. To, um, to to Hackney, uh, um, you know, to really try and um, you know create a slightly sort of more inclusive economy in those places, to try and open up opportunities um, in the knowledge economy institutions and businesses to, to local young people. But I think also, you know, and have to try to do quite conventional, um, um, you know, coordination, um, you know, around um, everything from you know sort of logistics. Um, to uh, you know, to local cultural events, to um, place making, <laughs> but also I think some some interests uh, in, in in gaining using the city that part of the city is a bit of a sort of sand pit to try new things out, to experiment, um, uh, you know, almost in real time, and to sort of reiterate things as as as, as they go along, um, which you know, which is something which is you know you couldn't have imagined happening sort of twenty or thirty years ago. I mean, it's been enabled partly by technology. Um, usually by technology, but also I think just by general change in sort of values and the way that people um, understand uh, research and, and innov innovation, which has sort of you know got pretty profound consequences. And probably where you know the cities like the cities represented here, um, you know, still potentially um, somewhat sort of you know, ahead of the game. Uh, but Benjamin, I was just going to ask a bit about. I mean, it sounds as if you you do work with Berlin's. Uh, universities and I mean what sort of role are they playing in in the city um, I mean are they because I mean again in the UK I don't know whether this is true in France but definitely in the UK there is a sort of growing pressure to be fair partly from from national government um, for universities to sort of get get more involved in the in, in their local communities um, to engage more with policymakers as well as as well as with businesses I mean some of this has quite a narrow commercial agenda um, it's about Bridging the valley of death between uh, academic innovation and commercial innovation, um, or commercializable innovation, but it's partly actually about, as I say, it's about engaging communities, engaging the public, working with policymakers, taking down the the walls that were such once a feature of universities. Are you seeing that in 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 Berlin? Um, yes, of course, I see that. I mean, I, I'm, but the, 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 again, the way that I that I look at universities as very much, I look at the characters that I deal with in the university and not at the university as an institution. Because uh, whenever I talk to uh, the, the people that I know that are either uh, uh, in the, on, the, on the student side of the university or on the teaching side of the university and even some of the people that work in the administration, everybody is more, and, and this is, 
Europe wide, and or maybe even worldwide, everybody is like, oh no, I get headaches when I think of uh, changing something within the institution of the university, because it's so big. These are so big flagships of knowledge that it's really hard to maneuver them into new, to, into new fields. And, uh, and for all these people, they are really like, they, they are hungry and thirsty for these, uh, for these places um, that we, in this case, provide uh, with, with the floating university, where they can just go with their students and you know start breathing again and 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 actually uh, um, um, start with the experimentation that they would you know, as free as they they uh, most of them think it needs to be done to actually move forward with all these big questions that also universities with their knowledge will have to solve and you know climate change and diversity and 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 uh, uh, and the shortage of resources and uh, and and so on are, are just a small small part of that, and all these questions can only be solved if we are very quickly innovative uh, with a couple of things, and, and and this also means we have to be innovative in forms of commu of communication and this polydisciplinary or multidisciplinary or extra disciplinary exchanges that actually bring, uh, bring this forward. And that, then I, I, but I also see that happening uh, when I, 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 I was able to take part in an event uh, uh, a couple of years ago together with Bruno Latour in the Théâtre des Armandiers in Nanterre, where we were pre-enacting uh, the, the, the COP, COP21 uh, in Paris to, uh, together with lots of uh, uh, political science students uh, initiated by his like multidisciplinary group uh, from Sciences Po, uh, where really 300 students came together to pre-enact the climate summit to come to uh, uh, the, the the necessary results that we needed to you know actually change our climate policies globally, and uh, and and that was uh, that that again I I think this was only possible, this collaboration of, uh, of uh, the political science university with uh, a, a, a very experimentally oriented theater uh, and theater director as well, uh, together with us and my students at that time from, from Essen uh, to, uh, to do this because it was Bruno Latour, right? So we, I think what we, what we need and what we also need to uh, promote more is uh, is you have to uh, we have to create more of these characters and these you know em empathic <laughs> people that are just that just don't care about the way to that you know these normal processes work but say now we have to you know we we have to radically change uh, the way that we do things and this is super difficult from the position of a city administration i think uh, <laughs> that, uh, that uh, and also from from uh, the position inside a university this can only happen when you are kind of a, a free player joker outside uh, um, and uh, and create uh, to create these kind of new fields right Thank you. No, no, I'm, I'm very aware that we haven't um, uh, taken questions to the audience because we haven't had very many, but there's a, there's a few more coming in now. We've got two from um, Avnesh uh, Martani, um, one about Brexit, and I might address that to, to, to Joe, um, and one about social media. Um, and uh, clearly that one is, is absolutely made for Jean-Louis, who, as I just said, um, has just published a book, uh, uh, Le Business de Laine. Um, which uh, which is addressing these themes. So let's, uh, Joe. Do you want do you want to sort of? I don't know whether you've got anything to say on Brexit or whether that whether there's a, you feel the verdict. Is I'm not, happy. I'm know. happy to take that one, uh, Ben. Uh, the question is, how has Brexit influenced knowledge diplomacy between institutions in the UK and the EU? And um, the short answer is yes, it has, and probably negatively. Um, 
the most obvious reason is that uh, access to research funding, existing research relationships, the long-term building of um, relationships uh, around programs like Erasmus, all that's been dismantled and, and um, we still have lack of clarity in the UK as to our investment in and involvement in um, European research funding. So at an institutional level, it's profound. At city level, I think there's some interesting questions to look at. International diplomacy uh, and knowledge diplomacy is something that takes place mainly at national level. And in the UK, at least, uh, cities um, and devolved administrations are underfunded and poorly resourced. So acting independently is not simple, but cities are the obvious place in which to maintain, strengthen and build on old and bring in new relationships for, for the future. Cities are a place, uh, I've, I've been in, I've worked on cities and conflict and I've been in war zones where people will hate the British but will still wear a Manchester United t-shirt. There are opportunities for cities to remain connected, to build knowledge diplomacy, not just through universities, um, but through cultural institutions and cultural exchange. And throughout the Brexit negotiations, DAAD, Goethe, Alliance Francaise, Campus France and British Council worked absolutely solid, solidly and regularly together to keep those channels open. And I hope uh, they are still doing so. Thank you, that's, that's a great answer. Uh, Jean-Louis. Yeah, well, my answer is very, very easy and simple. It, it doesn't affect only uh, uh, knowledge diplomacy, it affects uh, uh, knowledge uh, shortly because, uh, because uh, the, the main problem with uh, the social networks is the uh, algorithm uh, which incites uh, which uh, amplify polarization, political polarization. And uh, the, 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 the subject is that <clears throat> uh, this polarization is also affecting uh, knowledge through what I call in my book, politization of expertise. And uh, uh, you can see it, uh, of course, uh, uh, inside the universities. Uh, with the politicization of uh, academic research and the fact that it's more and more difficult uh, to have uh, open conversation, uh, polite conversation on certain subjects like uh, uh, decolonization or uh, uh, the, uh, the question of uh, transsexuality. And uh, I think that uh, this phenomenon uh, is also very dangerous for cities because generally uh, the, the political uh, confrontation in the cities were more uh, polite, uh, more civilized and, uh, and sometimes focused on the general interest. And more and more, and it's, it's true in Paris, I don't know how it works in London, but in Paris, it's very, very uh, significant uh, you have a fen this phenomenon of polarization at the level of the city, which is totally disastrous uh, for uh, the governing the governance of the city. Uh, Jean Louis, I think uh, what you froze for a you, you froze for a moment but you're back but oh, you, i'm sorry i say okay. but we, 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 we very quickly so what, what are the issues in particular that have proved so divisive and polarizing within within paris i mean are they issues about the municipality of paris about the government the governor there, there is a, a strong polarization here in uh, in paris about the management of the public space yeah and, the, res and the respect of uh, uh, the patrim the patrimonial uh, heritage Right. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, there is a, a campaign on, on Twitter called Sakash Paris. And this campaign is, is defamatory uh, for, uh, for the municipality, but it's not, the, the, the question is not to, 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 to ask who, who is right and who is wrong. Uh, the question is that it's uh, what we call ascension to extreme. 
uh, uh, its polarization, its in it, its worst uh, uh, design. So I, I think that uh, um, the, the 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 question. Of, I'm not sure that this phenomenon is only because of the social networks. It's it's a global social cultural. You know, uh, but what is very uh, uh, important for us uh, is to understand how much it can relationship is the relationship between city, citizens in relationship between uh, academic uh, uh, in, inside the universities because uh, it's also a, a very uh, strange situation that it's more and more difficult to have a free conversation on certain subject inside the universities. Right, right. And I mean, I, I, we, we are running out of time, so I'm, I'm going to pose a question, but I'm not sure you're going to, I'm not going to ask you to answer it, but I might come back to you, which is just, is there anything that cities can do? I mean, particularly about, well, in, in, in this space, what city governments can do. I mean, they don't tend to have regulatory powers over, over social media, but, but I, I do want to sort of bring in Ben, particularly um, perhaps ask Benjamin and perhaps ask Benjamin to, to respond to Anne-Louise uh, Milne's question about- I think the only, the only thing that cities can do uh, is to, a push in favor of participatory uh, democracy, local participatory democracy. Because when you put people together uh, in real life, not yeah. on the social media, but in real life, and when you organize, you, you organize a true conversation and confrontation, you discover that you share more than you can imagine with people you think they are totally against you. Yeah. So I think that this part uh, of the uh, of the uh, fight against uh, polarization can be taken in charge by municipalities. Brilliant. Um, and I think my, la my last question, and it's an addressed initially at Benjamin, but I'm opening it up to others if we have time afterwards, which is Anne-Louise Anne Mill's question, um, which you will see, see here about, um, you know, uh, what well, as I take it, a sort of it's a question. Um, I hope I got this right about um, how you create the sort of spaces that you're creating in Berlin, Benjamin, um, globally. You know, uh, between between cities or or universities or or, or groups. Um, you know, which aren't in a single territory. You know, and does that have to be? I mean, yeah, sorry. And does that? I guess that has to be. Um, a uh, digital solution or or taking jean louis point actually is the value of face-to-face -face and sort of um encounters and deliberative spaces so important that we actually do have to bring people together face to face yeah i i know it, it, it is actually a difficult question and as i'm uh, i'm not only kind of a local player but i'm um, i'm also requested uh, uh to to transport uh, our ideas and, and, and strategies and tactics to, uh, to work with cities to other places, I experience very much that um, there is certain things that stay, that are very comparable in, in, in most of the cities. And these are normally uh, very global phenomena that, uh, that spread also through social media and that, um, that are, well, I, I would say very often things get a bit simplified. And then when you, when you dive into the local situation and you get into the, 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 the complete complexity of, uh, of, of, of the local culture, uh, the, the, the way that people uh, spend their, their everyday life and, and so on, then, um, then it becomes on one side more difficult, but also more interesting to, uh, to de develop a local uh, solution. I think we have to, um, we, we have to de-globalize certain kind of knowledge discourses as well to, uh, to be able to solve local, uh, local situation or to, 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 you know, to bring new impulses into local situations and not export every, every idea that we have had in one place to another place. I think that's, uh, that's probably certainly the wrong way to act. But of course, um, uh, that certain ways of exchange and certain, uh, a certain kind of openness towards 
other other ways of of thinking and doing things is is always helpful and helps very much to uh, to be um, uh, to be more um, tolerant towards uh, yeah. experimental forms of knowledge production. Brilliant. I think that's a brilliant note on which 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 to end our discussion. Actually, I mean, you know, it's uh, di diplomacy shouldn't be seen as um, you know people with knowledge bringing it to, um, to, to 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 people without or creating models which which you which you naively think can be easily um, and appropriately replicated. Uh, so as I said, we run out of time. Um, I think a really rich discussion. Can I again thank uh, uh, the people who made it possible and the, and the people who helped organise it? ICR Research, uh, British Council, both in Germany and France. Uh, the Goethe Institute, um, University of London Institute in Paris, and Queen Mary University of London. Um, thank you to Joe to, to, to jo Bill, and, and a special thank you to uh, Jean-Louis and, and, and Benjamin, and I should have acknowledged this at the beginning, you know, that we're, we're speaking in English, but they are our native language, and they are, that, that they are they're doing a brilliant job speaking in, our, in, a, in a second language. Um, so uh, all credit to them, all tribute to them. Um, thank you all for coming. We will be writing these, uh, this and the other events up into a report, which um, we'll be sharing in due course. Um, and uh, I've certainly found it um, a really uh, rewarding and enriching um, and worthwhile session. So. Thank you very much. Goodbye.